Hi guys, we're going to give it just a couple more minutes and we'll start. Okay, here we are. are. Am I on? Hi, Tammy, you're on. Okay, thank you. Hello, friends of American writers. First of all, I would like to thank Karen Baker for that lovely slideshow that we just saw, plus all she has done to uh, enable this new phase of our long history. Who could have imagined last March that the world as we knew it was about to change for such a long time? Yet, here we are. Among all the big challenges COVID-19 has created, a very small one was how to keep our organization going. So thank you to all of you for rejoining, despite all the uncertainty, and for coming today to support all our wonderful prize-winning writers who are here with us today. And thank you to the board members who have worked much harder than usual to figure out a way to plan our meetings this year. We are all sorry that we can't be enjoying the program after a delicious lunch at the fortnightly, but I thank you for making do and being flexible. For today's program, we will hear from the chairs of the Adult Literature Awards, Ida Hagman and Karen Pulver, and the Young People's Literature Awards Chair, Angela Gall, as well as from the five prize winners. Afterwards, we'll have a short period of Q&A with the authors. I'll explain how to do that later. After a very short break, those of you who signed up for chat rooms will go to the second link in the email invitation you've received and enter the second Zoom link, where you'll be able to chat with smaller, a smaller group. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Literature Awards co-chair Ida Hagman. Hello. Last year, 72 titles were submitted to our committee, filling several shelves in Karen Pulver's bookcase. Some came from publishers and some directly from emerging authors, along with personal commentary about their writing journeys. We carried the books to meetings in shopping bags and suitcases, then distributed them among readers eager to find the next winners. Using some specific criteria regarding language, character, plot, and themes to rate the books, our group retained and eliminated books at each meeting. We also considered the tone, identification with the Midwest, and emotional contact with the reader. Our ratings could vary greatly, and our opinions were swayed through discussion. It was a privilege to have deep conversations about books and to have lunch in the elegant women's athletic club. This year, when it was time to make our final decision, COVID-19 prevented us from meeting together. Everything had led up to that moment and we couldn't have it. It was disappointing and frustrating, but a mere plague cannot stop FAW. We had our final discussion through e email and goggle docs and we made our decision. Thanks to committee members Diana Adams, Adrian Bornstein, Tammy Bob, Carrie Brenner, Karen Burnett, Dale Davison, Ellen Israel, Kathy Katz, Diane Miller, Karen Pulver, Barbara Smith, and me. Now for one of our winners. 
The Municipalists is a science fiction buddy story about Henry, a city planning employee, and his sidekick, Owen. Owen is a supercomputer with more personality than his human partner. When a terrorist plot threatens the city, Henry and Owen set out to save the metropolis. Comedy, chaos, and an ending with a message of unity follows. What did the committee like about the municipalists? One member said, the municipalists is a highly original, funny, certainly a riff on ways current society can be headed for total surveillance and management by unknown, perhaps megalomaniacal corporate entities. I love that the main character was so unlikable and that a computer could be fully human. Also, I believe a major point here is that those who are certain that they are right about any and everything can be most dangerous to a free society. Other members lifted up the author's style and a plot that moves along swiftly. Today, we are fortunate to hear from the author of The Municipalists, Seth Freed. Freed is the author of the acclaimed short story collection, The Great Frustration. He is a recurring contributor to the New Yorker's Shouts and Murmurs and NPR's Selected Shorts, and his stories have appeared in Tin House, One Story, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, The Kenyon Review, Vice, and elsewhere. He is also the winner of two Pushcart Prizes, and here he is. First, I would like to thank the Friends of American Writers. Receiving this award is a huge honor and incredibly meaningful to me. I could only speak to my own experience, but I feel confident saying that your recognition has a profound impact on all the writers who receive this award. I appreciate your organization not just as one of those writers, but as a reader and as a person. You're putting encouragement into a field of artists that sorely needs it, and I wish there was a way to calculate the good you're doing by making people feel seen in their work and ready to keep going. So sincerely, thank you. My novel, The Municipalists, is a comic thriller inspired by the infrastructure of cities. I've always been curious about cities, a curiosity that has led me to books like The Death and Life of Great American Cities, The Triumph of the City, and even more fantastic contemplations like Italic Alvino's Invisible Cities. What I learned in my reading, and also in my own interactions with urban spaces, is that because they are built by people, in addition to being some of humankind's greatest achievements, the physical structures of cities are often dramatic externalizations of our politics and our philosophies. I think a good rule of thumb in life is that the things people do are often more revealing than the things they say. Well, cities are things that people have done. And the fact of a city tends to be more revealing than the words of its leaders and public servants and even its own citizens. The picture a city paints can be inspiring, but just as often it can reveal difficult truths about ourselves. The structures of a city make plain the sort of iniquities that many of us might prefer to ignore. My book attempts to address this fact while acknowledging that this is only the first step of a process in which there are no easy answers. A question my characters get asked is how to move into the world with your sense of what's right while making sure you do more good than harm. In this context, what's more valuable and more humane? Pure idealism or political savvy? stubbornness in your truths, or being open to new information. I don't pretend to know, but as a fiction writer, fortunately, I only have to articulate these very old questions in a way that will hopefully make them feel worthy of further discussion. This book is important to me because it touches on a lot of things I care deeply about when it comes to people and the direction the world seems to be moving in. I put a lot of my hopes and fears into it, and it is a tremendous honor to find out that this book's questions have resonated with readers of your caliber. So again, thank you and stay safe. Everyone is probably familiar with Tolstoy's comment about how every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Well, how about a dying mother who knows her husband has cheated and who has a stash, a secret stash of money for her children? Or a son dealing with his own sexuality who's blown his inheritance on drugs and bad business ventures. Or a daughter struggling to find her approach to today's society. And a father with a pushy girlfriend 
who barely hangs on to his adjunct position at a university in St. Louis. As children and father reunite and attempt to reconcile, our prize-winning author shows us well-developed characters in a mostly Midwestern setting, demonstrating the difficulty of escape from the past. The committee found something to like in each character and appreciated the commentary on life situations unique to today. The communication between generations and the popular idea of everybody's trying to make a difference. For these reasons, and for the very readable style of the novel, the Adult Awards Committee is very pleased to present one of this year's prizes to Andrew, Andrew Ritker for The Altruists. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Ridker. Uh, I'm the author of The Altruists, uh, which won a, uh, one of this year's literature prizes. Um, I want to start by thanking all the members and officers at the Friends of American Writers. I'm extremely humbled to join the ranks of the many, many brilliant writers who have won this award before me, and I only wish I could thank you all in person. Uh, writing is such a solitary activity. You can never really be sure if your work will connect with an audience or know who that audience might be. So to receive an award from what is clearly a very tight-knit, book-loving community like yours is a terrific honor and the kind of thing I could only dream about while writing The Altruists. Uh, I started writing uh, the novel in 2015. I'd graduated college less than a year earlier, and though I knew I wanted to write, I didn't know what I should write about, and in the meantime, how I was supposed to pay the bills. The job market had recovered somewhat from the financial crash in uh, 2008, but the options nonetheless felt limited. And I'm not a sociologist, but it seemed to me that in the months after graduation, my friends tended to head off in either one of two directions. Some went on to earn huge salaries working in the financial industry as bankers and consultants, and others took a very different route, signing up for programs like Teach for America and City Year, making very little money in an attempt to give back to society. Now, my finance friends felt guilty about their salaries in an era of historic inequality. And remember that uh, Occupy Wall Street had taken place in, in what was my sophomore year. Uh, but my friends in Teach for America and those other programs felt guilty too. They hadn't received adequate training, the schools where they worked were underfunded, and deep down they worried that with their lack of expertise and training, they were actually causing more harm than good. And the allure of money and status, and the allure of doing good, and the problems inherent in both, that really provided the jumping off point uh, for the novel. Now, I should say that at that time, I was neither making money nor doing the world any good. Uh, I was living at that point in a tiny, coffin-sized apartment in Ridgewood, Queens, uh, and I could actually stretch my arms out and touch the walls on either side of my room. Uh, my window overlooked a construction site, and in the mornings, I woke up to a view of a giant pit, which seemed to get bigger and bigger with every passing day. My rent was $750 per month, and that was pretty much all I earned uh, working as an intern as a, at, a, at a publishing house. Now, I couldn't see a way out of my situation, so like any writer, rather than attempt to solve my problems, I invented a character and dumped those problems onto her. Uh, her name was Maggie Alter, and she also lived in a tiny coffin-sized apartment in Ridgewood, Queens. Her window also overlooked a giant pit. Um, and Maggie, as I envisioned her, was the kind of highly political young woman who really wanted nothing more than to make the world a better place, but her refusal to compromise her extremely high ethical standards and to reckon with her own selfish impulses prevented her from making a real impact. And so like many of my friends, and very much like myself, she was someone who wanted to do good and to be a good person, but was finding that easier said than done. Now, when I started out, I only had Maggie. I didn't intend to write a family novel. I thought at first I would follow her exclusively, but in time I realized I needed more characters, more action, more momentum, which is how I wound up bringing in her brother, Ethan, and her father, Arthur. 
And it wasn't until late in the game when I started writing her mother, Francine, that I figured out the actual story about uh, a secret inheritance that Francine leaves behind for her children and that her husband, Arthur, attempts to win back. Now, at its core, this is a book about inheritance. I was interested in exploring where we get our personalities and values from. Are we fated to repeat the mistakes of our parents? What do we owe them for raising us? And what do we hope to pass on to our children? But I was also interested in inheritance in the literal sense. Now the inheritance plot in fiction goes back at least as far as the Victorians. You know, that's the kind of novel where the children and grandchildren and sometimes even strangers scheme around the dying patriarch's bed to get themselves you know, written into a will, for instance. And I wanted to turn that plot on its head and have it be, first of all, the matriarch who has the money, and secondly, the patriarch who's chasing after the children for it, rather than the children chasing after him. And through that inversion of a, of a sort of familiar plot, I was hoping to explore and to some degree subvert the narratives about millennials and baby boomers that I saw playing out in the news media. I was at the time and remain very deeply interested in questions of privilege. Who has it, who wants it, and what people do when they get it. But I'm saying all this as though I set out with these themes in mind, um, as though writing is a straightforward process of making a plan and executing it. But in actual fact, I think writing is more like archeology. span the writer digs for and gradually uncovers the book that has been there waiting for him all along. In my case, that novel was The Altruists, and as I work on my second novel, digging and dusting and trying to discover what it is, I'm emboldened by the faith that you all have in me. And I'd like to thank you again so much for this award, which means the world to me, and I hope that our paths cross soon uh, under safer circumstances. Thank you. Hello everyone. Before I begin, I want to recognize my awesome Young People's Literature Award Committee members. Although you are out there somewhere in cyberspace, I just want you to know that my love and appreciation are very real right here. So Tanya, Peggy, Vivian, Colleen, Betty, Jane, Deb, Vicki, Gail, Patty, Joan, Sally, and Roberta, thank you for a wonderful year and here's to the next. This year, the Young People's Literature Awards Committee had three excellent winners. I am thrilled to present our first winner. Her name is Jessie Ann Foley, and she wrote the young adult novel, Sorry for Your Loss. Her story is about a teenage boy who is the youngest of eight children dealing with the loss of his beloved brother. And our committee members love this book for so many reasons. Tanya from our committee valued how our author emphasized the idea that grief shows many faces. For example, one of the characters dealt with the loss of his brother through drinking alcohol, and another sibling abused herself physically to distract from the grief. And we all agreed that the main character, nicknamed Pup, did the death in the most productive way. Pup used photography as a vehicle in which to ease his pain. His photographs captured his family at their most vulnerable. The rawness of their feelings were revealed and the photos provided a tool in which to discuss their pain and heal from them. And I have to say that we had one member of our group who absolutely rooted for this book. Deb felt that she knew this Irish Catholic family of 10. Deb's mom came from a large family and when she went to school with someone who now has 14 children, and to see a piece of her own experience reflected in this book was everything. Probably the most fun aspect of our whole committee was of this from our whole committee was that this book is set in Chicago. When the main character donned a Cubs baseball cap and walked down a familiar street, we grew even more enamored with this book. Even if some of us are Sox fans. Thank you, Jesse Ann Foley, for giving us such a heartfelt and hilarious read. Even when dealing with such a heavy topic, you managed to lighten the mood with quirky, entertaining scenes, the measure of a true writer. And before becoming a professional writer of young adult novels, 
Jesse Ann Foley spent 10 years as a high school English teacher and creative writing teacher. She holds an MFA in fiction writing from Columbia College in Chicago. And she actually lives right here in Chicago with her husband and three young daughters. I now present to you a video of Jesse Ann Foley. Hi, friends of American writers. Um, this is Jesse Ann Foley, author of Sorry for Your Loss. Um, just wanted to say thank you so much for this wonderful honor um, and this award. And I really wish that we could all celebrate together in person, but um, I guess this is going to be the next best thing. Um, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the process of how the book came into being. Um, I've always been interested in huge families. I don't come from one myself, although I do have a very large extended family. But when I was growing up, um, for whatever reason, um, maybe because I went to Catholic school, um, a lot of my friends were one of six, one of seven, one of 10. And so I grew up hanging out with kids who had those big family dynamics. And I've always just been fascinated by that um, kind of family. Um, so I interviewed a lot of those old friends in the writing of the book. It originally um, was a, a comedy and my editor, when she read the first draft, um, just felt like there needed to be more at stake. Um, and she was right, something just was missing. Um, and so I kind of went back to the drawing board and as I was doing so, I read an article in the New York Times about creativity and where it comes from. And um, there were interviews with different, different musical artists like Kendrick Lamar, Tom Waits, and Beck um, talking about what their impetus is to create. Um, and in the article, it talked about um, the great musician and poet Leonard Cohen um, and how in the last interview he gave before he died a few years ago, somebody asked him, you know, why do you still feel the urge to create? Um, and he said that it was about making the emergency inside of yourself articulate. And that just blew me away because it, that's why I write is um, there's something inside of me that has to be transformed um, into language. And that's how I explore the things that I'm interested in, the things that I care about is through my fiction. Um, so then I decided to take it uh, literally and apply Cohen's words to the book. And I said, okay, so here's a kid named Pup Flanagan. Um, what's his emergency inside of him? and how can he make it articulate? So um, I came up with the idea of growing up in a, a family that doesn't talk about their pain and how that pain and grief manifests itself in other ways. And I think um, in some families, grief begets more grief. Um, and so I wanted to have this kid who was just hurting so badly and had no way to express the pain. Um, until he meets his teacher who gives him a chance at photography and he discovers his abilities as an artist. Um, I think it's really important to portray some teachers because I really do think that for some kids all it takes is one teacher who believes in them and it can totally turn it around. And for me that was my high school creative writing teacher, Dr. Burke, um, who has since attended every single one of my book events um, and you know has become a good friend to me but she she I wanted to sort of pay homage to the power of a good and loving teacher as well um, and so I had to learn a whole lot about photography I've never done darkroom photography I had to learn all about that um, which is a really interesting process and so that's how the book came together um, and I'm so pleased and happy that people have responded to it in such a such a positive way um, because it it was a book that I had to go back to the drawing board three times tear up a complete draft and start over and uh, so it, it feel like it was worth it in the end um, so thank you again so much for for this award it really means a lot to me um, and I really wish I could meet all of you uh, in person but um, I really just am glad to um, be here and thank you so much for listening. Bye. 
Thank you, Jesse, for that great video. I love the message about creativity. The next winner of our Young People's Literature Award is Anne Schoenbaum. She wrote Rising Above Shepherdsville. Her work is a compelling story of a young girl struggling to cope with the death of her mother. And our committee members love this book for so many reasons. Peggy from our committee enjoyed the beautiful, strong characters, the multi-generational relationships created. The adults in the main character, Dulcie's life, knew how to be sensitive to her emotional needs and not push her until she was ready. The wisdom of Reverend Love, Evangeline, and Aunt Bernie are the types of influential characters all kids would benefit from today. And our committee was blown away by the concept that death of her mother made Dulcie completely mute for months. Her muteness was a powerful instrument to highlight the devastation of death. Our author created another effective element when she healed Dulcie through the viewing of swans and a nearby pond. The swan symbolized her relationship with her mother. Dulcie blamed the death of her mother's suicide on herself. And when she witnessed how loving and fiercely protective the swans were with their own babies, she realized that her mother felt the same way no matter what. And Dulcie regained her voice. Sally from our committee summed up our feelings for rising above Shepherdsville succinctly. This book is exceptionally well drawn for the middle school reader. Especially appropriate are the dialogue, the lack of artifice, and the unapologetic presentation of religious faith unadorned. At a time with, when many young people are having to try especially hard to square the vagaries of daily life with their confused thoughts and feelings, this book presents a calm, clear-eyed view that is most appreciated. Thank you, Anne Schoenbaum, for your amazing work, your reminder that the mastery of our words and the authority they present in our society is a necessary lesson for our current world. Anne Schoenbaum was born in rural Ohio. These days, Anne lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota with her husband and two children. Anne holds a BFA in acting from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, and an MFA in writing for children and young adults from, from Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota. I now present Anne Schoenbaum on video. Hi, friends of American Writers. I'm Anne Schoenbaum and I'm coming to you from my home in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm sorry I'm not able to meet you in Chicago this fall but I'm happy that we have the opportunity to meet in the virtual world. I want to express my gratitude to the Friends of American Writers Young People's Literature Award Committee for selecting Rising Above Shepherdsville for the Young People's Literature Award. Thank you for spending time in Shepherdsville, living with the characters, and most of all, for loving them. Rising Above Shepherdsville might still be in my desk drawer if not for the support of my family, the Masters in Writing for Children and Young Adults program at Hamlin University in St. Paul, and the guidance of my editor, Alan Johnston at Beach Lane Books. I am a very fortunate first-time author. The opportunity to have your book published is a dream every writer has. My own road to publication was as unlikely as it was incredibly lucky. Rising Above Shepherdsville began as my creative thesis in graduate school. After that, the process of getting it out the door to agents or publishers seemed daunting, and I put it off for the better part of two years. I was fortunate to have the advice of author Gary Schmidt, whose encouragement was simple. In order to satisfy my curiosity about what was on the other side of the publishing wall, I'd have to throw my manuscript over it first. If I performed that one simple act of commitment, I'd be on my way to wherever I was going on my path to being a writer. I took his advice, got the manuscript out of my drawer, took a month, revised it, and sent it out to one person, Alan Johnston at Beach Lane Books. I figured I would get a rejection, but at least I would be launched on my journey as a writer. No one, certainly not me, would believe that one query letter would lead to a publishing contract, but it did. The novel itself grew from my desire to return to the places and people that remain dear to me. 
the very sensory elements that conjured connectivity to my childhood world. The smell of dust and engine grease in the bookmobile that visited my elementary school every week in rural Ohio. The glow of the flashlight under my covers as I read books like The Velvet Room, Tom's Midnight Garden, and Harriet the Spy. The squeak of furniture polish on wood as I read entire novels to my mother on Saturdays while she cleaned house. This power of transportation and time travel inspired me to consider the advice of my writing mentor, Jane Rash Thomas, to seek a tender spot at the core of my sensibilities, to explore what I might be reluctant to touch in my writing. Madeline Ingle said it best, you have to write the book that wants to be written. And if the book will be too difficult for grown-ups, you write it for children. Dulcie Louise Dixon, a 12-year-old with selective mutism, was formed from loss and the inability to talk about it. My challenge was to find and uncover Dulcie's voice. What began as a series of letters from Dulcie to her mother evolved into a secret conversation with the reader serving as eavesdropper. Dulcie's voice became strong enough that I served less as a writer and more of a scribe as I let her speak for herself. The process of writing has taught me to allow narrative to unfold on its own. If I try to force the story, it doesn't come. The blinking cursor is a sort of portal. I don't try to force my way through it. I allow it to open. I have to trust that the story will take me where I'm supposed to go, and I'm often completely surprised at where I end up. To write is to harness a sort of dreaming, a middle place between here and there that I get to step into each time I sit down to write. This might sound a bit mystical, but I believe the craft of writing is a direct conduit to our commonality. This summer, my family and I spent a week up north on an island far from city lights and people, the night sky bedazzled with stars. It was easy to imagine how our first stories originated under them and were passed and shared and have remained. Stories and storytelling make us the same. It's our greatest common denominator. For each story we tell, there are those who will receive it and make it their own by letting it touch them and become part of them. It's such a gift. Thank you, friends of American writers. I'm humbled and grateful. Be well. Thank you, Anne, for such a great video. Um, you have the most poetic voice and words. The final winner of our Young People's Literature Award is Jasmine Warga. She wrote Other Words for Home. It is an enchanting story written in poetic form that reads like prose. It is about a young Muslim girl from Syria who moves to Ohio to live with relatives where she has to be, where she has to learn to navigate her new world with bravery. And our committee members love this book for so many reasons. Joan from our committee was an early champion of Other Words From Home. And as she put it, Other Words From Home is poetic, but crystal clear. It describes the immigrant experience without over-exaggerating and sensationalizing it. And resist having an unrealistically triumphant ending, just a quietly happy one. Vivian from our committee thought, the author created a powerfully wrenching story of what happens when parts of family immigrate, how the children feel about moving with no say in the matter, and how they feel about those left behind so far away. Though a book for middle school children, it made us think, and it's a tribute to the author's writing style. She also gave us insight to Syrian culture, the headscarf, their food, religious practices which was thoroughly enjoyable. Another delightful aspect of this story was when the main character, Jude, tried out for the school play. Even her cousin was horrified that she dared to act with her foreign accent. And with courageous determination, Jude reminded us that we all deserve our moment in the spotlight. Roberta from our committee captured our feelings for this novel perfectly. Other words for home succeeds on every level. Plot, character, setting, theme, and language. Nuanced and very satisfying. 
Thank you, Jasmine Warga, for your lovely words that we hope will inspire change in the perspectives of all Americans. Jasmine Warga graduated with a degree in art history and history. And after graduation, she found a job teaching sixth grade science. While teaching, she began writing. She is now the author of three novels, which have been published in over 25 countries. Other Words From Home was awarded the John Newberry Honor. Jasmine grew up outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, but currently lives in the Chicago area with her husband and two little girls. I now present Jasmine Morga on video. Hi, I'm Jasmine Morga, and I want to thank the Friends of American Writers Awards Committee so much for choosing Other Words for Home in the category of Young People's Literature. I'm so, so honored. Um, Other Words for Home is the story of a 12-year-old girl named Jude who, due to the growing conflict in her home country of Syria, moves across the Atlantic Ocean to resettle in Cincinnati, Ohio. And the book is about the struggles and joys of making a new life in a new place. I wanted to write the book um, to give a testament to the bravery and courage of kids like Jude and also help to build awareness um, for what kids like Jude are going through. I've noticed we have um, an increasing atmosphere in our country um, that doesn't seem to have so much tolerance and empathy and generosity for children like Jude. And I'm hoping the story will help, uh, help open up some people's eyes to that. So thank you again um, to Friends of American Writers. I'm so honored and I'm thrilled that hopefully the book, um, because of this award, will find um, more readers. I wrote Other Words for Home in part because I was frustrated by the news coverage and the stories that I saw being told about kids like Jude, about refugee children from Syria. And on one hand, we had these stories that really demonized children like Jude and made us um, afraid of them. And then on the other side, we were seeing stories where they were just painted as victims. Um, and while these stories asked for our sympathy, I feel like they didn't fully flesh out these kids and show that they're people just like everyone else um, with thoughts and dreams and agency. And so I wanted to tell a more complete story, in other words, for home. I wanted to hopefully um, demystify some of the things that I felt like people were afraid of about these children, but I also wanted to show that these are kids just like all of our other young people that have hopes and dreams and thoughts. And so I love when young readers um, approach me and say that the book um, helped them to see Muslim or Arab kids differently and that's wonderful. But the thing that I love the most is when kids come up to me and they say that they saw themselves in Jude because I think the most wonderful thing about stories is that they show our collective humanity and they help us recognize that while well, it's important to celebrate our differences, it's even more important um, I think to remember our collective humanity and how much we all have in common. Okay, I'm back. Um, those were wonderful presentations. And while listening to the committee chairs and the authors, I was reminded of how much I admired, enjoyed each one of these books. Uh, it's been a while, few, several months since I've read them and they came back to me. I hope you will take the opportunity to read them as well, if you haven't done so already. You are now able to ask questions. Uh, the way you do this is click on the little raised hand icon in the toolbar uh, at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see the toolbar, it's because you haven't moved your mouse for a while. So if you move your mouse around just a bit, the toolbar should appear. And uh, Brian Johnson, the tech meister, who is also Karen Pulver's son-in-law, who is making this complex program seem easy and seamless, will let me know to call on you. But I did uh, take the liberty of gathering some questions from members so that we could get started. Um, okay, so the first question is for everybody, so I don't know how to... Um, let's start with Anne Schoenbaum, uh, just at random. Hi. Has, the Hi. Has the pandemic impacted your writing in any way? And what creative things have you come up with to co uh, combat its impact? Well, it hasn't really changed my day-to-day -day writing um, uh, 
pattern. I still get up in the morning and write for a few hours, the very first thing. But it has impacted the sense that my entire family is at home around me, which changes everything. I've had to give up my writing space to my daughter, who is now taking college online entirely. Um, so that's been a little bit of a, a, a new thing, but, but we're all dealing with it and doing well. Thank you. Would any of the other authors like to answer this question? I guess you could put your hand up. Okay, not a popular one. So we'll try something else. Um, so did anybody have a real, a big surprise after getting your book published, something that you really didn't expect would happen? Okay, we will go. We can come back to that if you think of something. Okay, let's. I have a question for Jasmine Warga. Uh, the title of your book, Other Words for Home, is very powerful. What do you want readers to think about in regards to your title? Oh, well, that's a that's a lovely question. Um, I think that the idea of right is that Jude's first language is Arabic, and she's learning English. And um, but beyond that, it um, comes from this idea that I often feel like when um, immigrants come to the United States, they feel this pressure to assimilate and choose. And I think that what has made the fabric of America um, such a special place is that we everyone brings kind of the best of the places that they came from and this idea that more than one place can be home. And so that um, is sort of something Jude starts to think about later on in the book that it's okay um, that Ohio is starting to feel like home, um, but that doesn't mean that Syria also is at home. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, about the municipalists. Um, Will there be a sequel with Owen 2.0? <laughs> I'd, I'd love for there to be. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I've, I've notes and stuff. I'm, I'm finishing up a couple other projects. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to, to see those two again in a project. Um, so yeah, so hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, I think we would love to see them as well. Um, oh, that's great. OK. For the altruists, um, the altars have been described as a dysfunctional family. Do you think there are functional families? Oh, can't hear. The audio, and, and Brian? You're still muted on your end. Okay, we'll come back to that because I think it's an interesting question. Um, is, he, is he unmuted? Okay, these things always happen in Zoom meetings. This is just the new reality. Um, okay, Anne Schoenbaum, we found it interesting that you set your book in the 70s. Why? Well, I remember the 70s very well, and I think that it was a time, I was a bit older actually in the 70s than Dulcie is in the context of this book. Um, so I, I, it was a time that I found incredibly fascinating, and I was a bit older, but coming of age in that time um, had its own, I mean, so very different than today's world, but I, I wanted to have a setting in which uh, we didn't have uh, computers and uh, young people weren't on their phones. I still long for that world, to be honest. <laughs> so I wanted to write about it. You know, sometimes when I read old books or watch old movies, it occurs to me that a lot of the things that move the plot along would simply not happen you know missed appointments and lost people and uh and exactly. so on i think that that has vanished from our life nowadays and i have one for jesse ann foley 
Your main character, Pup, hated the word sorry for your loss. What do you think is something to say to someone who has lost a loved one? What's the right thing? Um, I, <laughs> I get actually asked that question a lot. Um, and I think the, the issue that Pup had with that phrase was not that, um, not the words itself, but the lack of sort of real interest or follow-up. Um, I think when somebody dies, there's, I think we can all agree there's nothing you can say to make it better. Um, so I think it's okay to say sorry for your loss, um, but then follow up with checking in on that person, um, showing love for that person however you can, instead of being this rote um, thing that you say in a, in a awake or something. Um, so yeah, I think it's more about for him, um, it was just the people, something that, uh, because they were uncomfortable with his loss. So, uh, I do have something better, <laughs> um, but I think action is the important thing. Thank you. Oh, Karen. Karen had a question. Yeah, I have a question for, uh, Jasmine. Um, I'm curious about your choice to do your your novel in verse and what made you do that and what are your influences? Uh, oh, I can't hear her. Mm -mm. I'm, um, is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I was so mute. Um, so I originally wrote uh, the book in prose uh, because my first two books have been in prose and I it hadn't even occurred to me that I could write the novel in verse. Poetry is a huge part of my reading life, but I don't particularly consider myself to be a poet. Um, I'm friends with a lot of writers I who are really yourself. I just wondered if he had any input into the cover of his book, which was really striking. Sorry, that's a question from Trish. Uh, one second, Trish. Go ahead, Jasmine. Oh, okay. Um, and as I was working on the book, I felt that his voice just didn't feel right for me, which is a difficult thing to explain. But I think that, well, every time you um, work on a book, there is um, an image or a feel you have in your head and there's always a gap between what you're able to get out on the page and what it feels like in your head but for me when it was in prose that gap was so big I just wasn't able to swallow it and I didn't know how to fix it and uh, then I had this kind of aha moment that if I put the book into verse I might be able to collapse that narrative distance I was feeling between um, June and myself and I think that it worked um, Verse was well suited to the story in a sense because uh, Arabic is an inherently poetic language and I think it helped me to capture um, her speech pattern better and honor it. And I think that also, honestly, in a novel that kind of rides on your attachment to the main character that isn't like high concept in terms of plot or stakes, uh, Verse can be like well suited to um, hiding that immediacy. Thank you. Oh. And we had a question. So is now Andrew Andrew yeah, this is a question for Seth. If he had any input into the cover of his book, which I thought was very striking. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was, um, <clears throat> I talked with my editor to a couple of artists because it was an illustrated cover. Um, it's actually by a, a comic book artist named Matthew Taylor. Um, you can follow him on Instagram if you want to see more of his work. But um, when you do an illustrated cover, what they do is they send you like an early preliminary sketch and you can kind of give some feedback and stuff about colors and, and, and layout and stuff. But yeah, he was a joy to work with and I'm really happy with how it ended up. Um, so thank you for that. Are there more questions from the Zoom room? I see. Okay, is Andrew unmuted now? Yeah, do you want to try it, Andrew? Did you unmute on your end? Yeah, I, I would like to know about yeah. uh, Andrew, functional you families, if you know it. There's a little microphone. Is that muted? 
little icon of a microphone. Is he hearing this? We have a few more <coughs> hands raised. I'm sorry, Andrew, we're not able to hear you right now. Okay, uh, will you put through a raised hand then? Brian? Yeah, uh, I think Roberta has a question. Can you go ahead? Can you talk? Okay. This is a question for Jasmine. Uh, it was so sad in the book that um, Jude's father and brother had been left behind in Syria. And I just wonder if you as the author have any idea, will the family be reunited or won't they? <laughs> Jasmine, I think you're muted again. Sorry, I keep forgetting that. Um, I was saying that I think that's a wonderful question. I get asked that a lot um, at, at school visits and things like that. And I understand why um, people, and especially kids, uh, feel this impulse to want to know that. I don't have a great sense of that. I think that on an optimistic day, I want to believe that the family is together. Um, but. I know a lot of families who are still fractured and separated, and I think that that is something that happens when these conflicts erupt, and um, it's difficult. So, I, and I guess I feel probably the way everyone else does on this call when you get asked questions about your characters after the book has ended, that in some ways I like to say that belongs to the reader. So however you want to imagine the characters moving forward, um, your feeling about that is as, as valid as mine um, until another <laughs> book exists about uh, those characters. So yeah, I, um, uh, it's important to me to be honest about how difficult um, these conflicts and the, in particular Syrian civil war is on children and how children are separated. Um, from at least one parent, if not both of their parents. And um, so sadly, I, I, do, I don't think that the family is reunited, but I like to think that um, they are still like able to talk to one another and connect it in, in spirit. Okay, um, are there questions? I'm oh, sorry, we weren't able to hear from you. Oh. We have a question from Roberta Gates. From what? I don't, I don't really have another question, but I really appreciated your answer, Jasmine. And I think it is the right ending for the book to kind of leave us wondering what happens outside the pages of the book. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, and I understand it that that's not always the most satisfying answer. And I, I feel that way about books that I love. I want to ask the author, like, please tell me that this person um, is okay or this happens. But um, yeah, however you want them to live in your imagination is, is valid. I think we have one more question. My turn. Joan Gordon. Go ahead, Joan. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is for Seth. Um, science fiction is having a moment with cities right now. And so I wondered <laughs> the extent to which you are, as I suspect, a science fiction fan. Um, there's <laughs> N.K. Jemison's new book. There was Stan Robinson's book about New York a few years ago, um, Tade Thompson on Legos, and so on and so forth. So I was wondering, you know, and, and it's all about transforming cities to become more just. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's um, it's one of those. It was just kind. Of, yeah, I, I guess it was probably just in the zeitgeist. Of like I, um, because I was kind of moved forward with the book, kind of following my own interests. But it did kind of seem like there's a crop of them. There's Charlie Jane Anders also had a book, um, the kind of science fiction, like urban science fiction. Um, and as my my agent always gives advice on that, where it's sort of like if you see a bunch of like vampire romances on bookshelves don't try to write a vampire romance because by the time it hits the shelves, that's done. Uh, you just kind of have to follow your own interests. And sometimes it's kind of serendipity like that, you know, there's a crop of these books. I think there's also um, lots of really like a, um, the fun thing nowadays with the internet is like when you get into something that's a little niche, um, you find that there's, it's not that niche. Um, like there's a, a very vibrant um, group of young people online inspired by kind of infrastructure um, called num tots and they um they're just kind of like young people who are really aggressively interested in making cities better and more just and they share a bunch of memes about subways and stuff like that so it's it's fun it's it's great like um it's been fun putting that out there to kind of get connected to all this all these other people who are also interested in it are there any more questions um, I think that's it, Andrew. Did okay, was well, so one last time? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, Andrew. It's not working. I'm sorry. There's Mike isn't working, and uh, I will put in a plug for his book, which is absolutely terrific. It's both sad, it's funny, it's uh, which I always appreciate in a book. Uh, it's globe spanning, and it's very intimate as well. So. Um, that I don't know that that answers anything, but I did really enjoy that book. Okay, before we leave for the chat rooms, um, this is for the members, I want to remind you of my plea for money to provide each student in a first grade classroom at the Lawndale Community Academy with a copy of Thank You, Omu by Oge Mora, a past winner, our Young People's Literature Award. If you missed my note, please check out my message in the September newsletter available on our website. Angela Gall thought this project, rightly, is a small way for FAW to make a difference for a group of children facing extra difficulties right now. Thanks to those of you who have already contributed. If you want to know more about the project, don't hesitate to contact me or Angela. Thank you for supporting this. Now it's time to leave this room and sign into your second Zoom link. Thank you to the authors for being with us today and for the inspiring videos. And uh, see you in the breakout rooms. Uh, there will be a note from me about the October meeting in a few days. Thank you so much. Okay, time to go? Yes. Okay. Thank you again. Bye-bye.